Software to bring us the first three webinars to you. Tonight we host our second webinar, Pest Management of Tomatoes and High Tunnels. For this topic we have brought together three knowledgeable presenters who have spent many years experiencing or, or uh, with experience in working in high tunnels to give you an overview of basic tomato production, pest and mite control, and disease management. Before we begin, I want to go over some of the ground rules for how this webinar will be conducted. The only people who will have speaking privileges during tonight's webinar are the host, Liz and myself, and to mute your mic when not presenting. With that, let's begin our, with our first speaker, Dr. Matt Kleinhens, The Ohio State University, who will give us an overview of the tomato and other solanaceous crop production in season extension. Go ahead, Matt. You have 35 minutes for your presentation and then five minutes uh, for questions. Well, excellent. Thank you very much, Jim. And I would like to just uh, echo what I feel is uh, felt by all of the presenters this evening that Jim and, and uh, Liz have done an excellent job organizing the webinar series. And uh, without their contributions, it certainly wouldn't be possible. Um, I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to address the group tonight. And I see that it's a, a sizable group. and, and I, uh, one that represents a number of different states. And I'd like to just emphasize that um, if your questions are not addressed this evening, certainly do feel free to follow up with me um, by phone or email and my contact information is available uh, as part of the, uh, the handout and also at the end of the webinar uh, slide set that I will be using this evening. Um, I appreciate the fact that you've made an investment of time and money uh, to, be, to participate in the webinar. I hope to return that investment uh, by offering you some comments that will be able to make you a bit more successful in what you do. So without further delay, let's get right into the content of uh, my particular presentation, which is a focus on uh, an overview of tomato and other solanaceous crop high tunnel-based production systems. My real purpose this evening is twofold. First, I'd like to share with you some comments that are specific to a horticultural perspective on high tunnel based tomato production systems, but secondly, uh, prepare you to make excellent use of what I know will be very good comments to follow mine by our other two speakers specific to pest and disease management. So as we go through the next 30 minutes or so, do have a, uh, your mind set on the, the, uh, the real topic at hand, which is pest management. So. Open field and greenhouse and high tunnel systems do differ, and I think it's fair to say that we know less about the high tunnel systems than we do the other two, partly because we have less experience with high tunnels than we do with open field systems or with greenhouse systems. Um, but our experience is growing. Of course, uh, many of you on the webinar this evening recognize that high tunnel systems generally are smaller scale than open field systems. They're more intensively managed. Uh, high tunnel systems offer different temperature and moisture profiles. It typically does not rain or snow in a high tunnel, yet of course it does outside of the high tunnel freely in most, uh, most of our Great Lakes region. And that layer of plastic uh, does create a different temperature profile. We do have defined traffic patterns in open field production, but I believe that the, the traffic patterns within a high tunnel are even more defined and more intense because we tend to put our crops in the same places all the time, whether they are in permanent raised beds or, or semi-permanent beds. And in a high tunnel system, of course, there typically is less of an off-season. Uh, rotations can be shorter. We know that uh, for, for many, the production of tomatoes in a high tunnel is um, uh, one of the most common uh, crops grown. And some have taken a fancy to growing tomato after tomato after tomato which has its own implications in pest and disease management. Of course, high tunnel systems, because uh, of the exclusion of water, typically they are drip irrigated. But as you'll see in a later slide, this is not always uh, the case uh, exclusively. There, there are uh, circumstances under which other than drip irrigation can be employed in a high tunnel. And of course, because people have taken the, uh, made the investment in, in uh, establishing the high tunnel structure, the higher there is a higher investment cost per square foot, and therefore somewhat more risk associated with high tunnel production than in, in open field production. I see that in this particular slide, one of the lines on the graph 
uh, does not show, but it's the air temperature line. And the message that I was going to convey to you with this particular graph is something that experienced high tunnel users are probably familiar with, and that is the air temperature in a high tunnel tracks the solar radiation that is, uh, that is present at the time, but there is a slight delay. So if you had seen the air temperature line, it would follow the solid black line that you see, but it would be delayed in time by uh, a number of minutes to hours, depending on the circumstances. But the take home message, of course, is that the temperature in a high tunnel tracks the sunlight that is impinging upon it. Um, in this slide, also we're lacking the, the dotted line for the outside high tunnel temperature uh, and uh, the accumulation of growing degree days. And in the copy that I have, those growing degree days during the period March to May, at least on our particular location in Worcester, Ohio, for the open field uh, production uh, topped out at approximately 110, whereas, of course, in the high tunnel with much higher temperatures, those growing degree days topped out at nearly 600 during that same period. So we have an altogether different temperature uh, profile. And of course, we have uh, uh, that that is true whether it would be the March to May period, as we showed just a moment ago, or the October to January period, which is um, shown here in this particular slide. Again, information that is very, very familiar to most of the, uh, the viewers this evening. So the upshot of this uh, particular prelude or section of, this, of the webinar is that the high tunnel environment is very different from the field and the greenhouse environments. And the high tunnel environment may be conducive or disruptive to disease and insect complexes. And I show the disease triangle on the left and a sketch drawn by University of Minnesota researchers on the right uh, depicting the possibility to exclude pathogens and pests from the high tunnel environment um, uh, given, given, their, given their separation from open field. So the question I, I, I would like to put to you this evening is the host, the pathogen and the conducive environment are all required to facilitate disease, and I'm sure our second, or uh, uh, Sally Miller will will address this directly. But host, uh, a susceptible host, the correct pathogen, and a, and a conducive environment are all required to create disease. It is my opinion that in many cases, with respect to tomato production, that the host and the pathogen are both present. The real question is whether or not the environment will be uh, conducive to the onset of disease. But it, uh, I, I believe, and uh, certainly Sally can comment on this further, but I believe that in most cases the host and the pathogen uh, are present or at least uh, in close proximity to each other. And the real question is, will the high tunnel environment be managed such that disease triangle comes together as depicted in this particular slide? or if the, the high tunnel manager is successful in keeping the separation between the, high between the host, the pathogen, and the conducive environment. That is, I believe, the real um, question uh, at, at work here. And um, so as we get into the, the substance of the matter, um, we're going to ask a, a, uh, address a number of topics. First, I'm providing a system overview. And uh, the two presenters to follow me will address pests and mites and disease management specifically. In the system overview, I'd like to address structures, uh, the selection of varieties, uh, four aspects of crop establishment, uh, the question of whether to prune and trellis or not, uh, basic heating and cooling or temperature management of high tunnels, and the role of irrigation and, fer and fertilization programs in promoting or preventing disease and, and insect troubles. I am attempting to uh, place this all within an integrated pest management context as uh, the uh, elements that I'm depicted here in terms of selecting the right structure, selecting the correct variety, pruning and trellising, uh, and the like, all fit pretty much within the cultural management pillar of an IPM pest management program but uh, and make their own important contributions. And for those of uh, for those of you who grow crops on a routine basis, and I think most of you do, um, you realize that there is a, a fairly prescribed order of major activities to your operations on a seasonal basis, beginning perhaps with the selection of varieties and concluding with preparations for the next season. And all of the major steps, uh, and some, most of the major steps in between, uh, are depicted on this particular slide. And at each point in that uh, sequence you have, uh, as crop managers, an opportunity to either 
bring together that host pathogen and environment or to keep one or more of the three elements separate from the other two. We're focusing on tomato this evening uh, mainly because we feel uh, that in a high tunnel settings that is one uh, among the solanaceous crops it is uh, it is the most uh, commonly grown but I would like to emphasize bef uh, at this point that certainly you and I know that eggplants, pepper, and to a lesser extent tomatillo can also be grown uh, in high tunnels very successfully. Those crops differ, but they do share a number of uh, characteristics. They're all, of course, fruiting crops. They have a wide array of diversity in terms of variety of options. They are typically regarded as warm season crops. They require many days to mature. Uh, they have relatively high and exacting nutrient water and other types of cultural demands, which we will discuss later on. They do share some pest and disease complexes. They are relatively high value and they are well suited for in and outdoor production. Uh, so even though they have differences, I, I, I believe that they do share these particular similarities. And as farmers and as other uh, and crop managers, you realize that a high tunnel is a tool like any other tool that's used on the farm. And our job as crop managers is to select the right tool for the right purpose. And I asked a question here, do, they, do high tunnels create a different and an, or improved microclimate around the crop? This is uh, the real question that we have for this particular section of the presentation. And I'd like to depict uh, example high tunnels as we move forward that vary in their shape, their size, when they're used, and whether or not they're portable. In my experience, there are two basic types to high, uh, of high tunnel structures. Uh, the Quonset structure shown on the left, which is essentially a nearly U-shaped uh, bow. And on the right, we see a Gothic frame structure, which has a, a pitched roof and often at least a partially uh, straight sidewall. Both of them have pros and cons. And, and if you are a participant in the high tunnels listserv, or in other chat groups around high tunnel production, you realize that you should select the high tunnel that is specific to your purpose. There are, of course, some hybrids between uh, the, the two general types that are shown here, Quonset and, and Gothic style. And some of those hybrids have a very um, uh, shallow pitch to the roof, essentially a Quonset type roof, but then straight sides to uh, assist in raising the air volume and raising the side height and making more use uh, of the square footage underneath the high tunnel. So there are, uh, of course, uh, no hard and fast rules um, governing uh, this, uh, these, uh, the structure of the high tunnels themselves. But if there is a hard and fast rule, um, it would probably be that they are, uh, as far as tomato production is concerned, you would ask yourself, am I using the high tunnel exclusively for main season tomato production, beginning a little bit early or going a little bit late in the season? Or do I intend to use the high tunnel three or more seasons? Uh, will I grow tomato perhaps plus another crop, for example? And your decision on the, that particular point is going to influence what type of structure you choose. And of course, we also have multi-base systems available to us, which is uh, depicted here at least in, in its frame. And in the multi-base systems, it opens up a whole new range of opportunities and challengers to the tomato grower because they have an ever-increasing expanse under plastic to manage. And uh, a single base system, uh, for those who are familiar with it, is different from a multi-base system, partly because of its size and complexity and the expanse of crop that can be in, uh, grown under, uh, under plastic. And I'm just showing here a few images uh, taken from around the Great Lakes region or, or elsewhere of multi-bay uh, high tunnels being used for both tomato and, and for other crops. And it just seems as if these systems are uh, continuing to expand on our landscape. Portability, switching gears a bit to the question of portability. Portability does have advantages, certainly. One can move the high tunnel to new soil, rotate perhaps more effectively than uh, with a permanently moored high tunnel, uh, such as the two that are depicted here with a portable high tunnel. Um, one perhaps may not even need soil at all, uh, depicted with the, the grow socks uh, approach to, to management uh, shown here. On, on the right, you see a picture of a, a, of a developing lettuce crop. But I wanted to show you that the nylon uh, casing can accommodate any uh, um, rooting medium that is included in it. And 
can be used for tomato production, as this uh, image depicts here, where what you cannot see beneath the green canopy is the fact that all of those plants are rooted within uh, socks that are grown, shown, uh, shown in this particular image here. So one has the opportunity, for example, to grow on pavement or to grow where their native soil type is not conducive to tomato production. So that's a bit of a portable type crop. In my own experience, I'm using a pallet, a simple pallet box to, uh, to grow uh, bare root transplants, and I'm able to move those pallet boxes into or out of the high tunnel as, uh, as the requirements uh, dictate, there, thereby, I believe, making more effective use of the high tunnel space, which in my case is permanently, uh, permanently moored. So to wrap up this particular section, as it may relate to uh, disease management and pest management considerations, the choice of high tunnel will influence very strongly the season during which that high tunnel is used, of course, and therefore the crops that are grown in it. And it follows then that the, that the uh, season of operation and the crops that you're growing, in this case tomato, will uh, the pest management and disease management concerns will follow from that. The size and the structure of the high tunnel will influence the airflow, the, it's, uh, the high tunnel's configuration during high winds, some of you may be familiar with uh, the fact that many uh, Quonset style structures are designed to be open during high winds rather than uh, closed during high winds, which high winds, which is the case for Gothic style structures. Um, which, of course, uh, if there is inoculum blowing about, uh, brought, being brought in by storms, or if uh, pests are moving on storm systems, that has an obvious effect on uh, what could be present in the high tunnel. The size and the structure of the high tunnel will also influence the venting, uh, the, the temperature management, which we will get into in here in a few minutes, and therefore uh, either produce a conducive environment or a disruptive environment to the onset of disease or pest issues. And it certainly may influence, uh, that is the size and the structure, may certainly influence the access that one has to the high tunnel with certain types of equipment. And I'll back up just a slide or two. and. Um, and uh, bring that around to a, a focal point. Uh, many of you know that uh, to enter this particular type of high tunnel uh, with certain disease or pest management equi equipment um, is difficult. Uh, some would spray it from the outside, therefore questions of cover coverage uh, would come into play, and so on. But uh, my main take-home message for you this evening is that the size, structure, and configuration of the high tunnel will influence your ability to apply you know, crop protectants uh, efficiently or, or uh, with certain types of equipment. We'll switch gears now to variety selection. And uh, variety selection is one major component, of course, in an IPM-based uh, program. It's my opinion that all of the factors that affect the crops can be categorized and placed into one of three categories. The genes involved, uh, the genetics of the crop, the decision of the crop manager and, and the weather. Um, more or less the outcome of every cropping operation I feel can, is determined by the interaction of those particular uh, three factors. And I certainly do not need to uh, you know, lecture you on the importance of, of variety selection because uh, you are well aware of it as successful crop managers that the choice of variety does influence the bottom line quite directly through the two channels that are depicted in this particular slide. The variety influences marketable yield potential, and it can certainly influence market, market appeal. And therefore, uh, it influences the inputs that one must uh, apply and the revenue that, they, that is generated. So uh, again, variety selection is very, very important to, to all of us in one way or another. Over the years, I have uh, had a variety trial program uh, in which we have evaluated some 600 varieties of 18 different commodities at many different locations uh, throughout Ohio. And I've come to conclude that the six sources of information that are depicted here are very, very important to crop managers as they select varieties. And I'm, and I'm certainly um, uh, not advocating that. Uh, I do advocate that, uh, that crop managers use all six forms or sources of information selecting their, their, their particular varieties. Your own personal experience can be very important, as, of course, can be the experience of university research and extension people and other growers members of the seed trade and, and consultants. And I would encourage you to use results from your local, reliable evaluations and put all the inf best information together to select 
the varieties that will perform best for you. As a general rule, within tomato crop production in high tunnels, I believe that most of the success, most of the varieties that perform well in open field situations also perform well in high tunnel situations with one protect, potential caveat, and that is we do look for more heat tolerance in most of our tomato varieties, especially if uh, the opportunity uh, for the crop manager is, uh, to cool the crop is, uh, is reduced. We're moving into our second section on crop establishment, and I'll first refer to seedling production. And as most of you know, uh, most of the solanaceous crops are transplanted, and this brings, to quite, brings into play immediately seedling production issues. And there are many sources of seedling loss in, uh, in seedling production of solanaceous crops, including tomato, such that one could need to sow 35% more seed than the number of plants that they actually need uh, for their particular operation. And uh, it's important to keep that in mind as you go forward because you are very familiar with the challenges associated with going from seed to uh, a proper, proper seedling. Um, and the diseases, for example, is depicted here that can, can arise at almost any time when the host, the pathogen, and the environment are, uh, are conducive to it. So as a, as a take home message, uh, and perhaps Sally will emphasize this even more, more so later, Cleanliness is key, and I would often recommend that uh, folks use new materials as often as possible, making sure that they're clean, and of course following uh, proper handling and management principles. But much has been written and said about uh, vegetable transplant production, so I encourage you to follow those sources of information as closely as you can. Second aspect of crop establishment and site rooting medium preparation. Our focus here is on the suppression or eradication of disease organisms and insects. And of course, uh, soil fumigation for many years has been a key tool for many tomato growers. And methyl bromide is being phased out, but chemical replacements are coming to the fore. But what about other options? Well, biofumigant crops um, are, are growing as an option, or at least being more seriously tested. So is uh, solarization as a technique for uh, partial sterilization or temporary sterilization of the soil. This is taking advantage of the sun's energy to raise the soil temperature and thereby deactivate or um, eradicate certain pests and disease organisms or propagules. Soil steaming takes that to another, uh, another level, if you will, by using uh, steam as a source of heat and uh, uh, as uh, pretty directly uh, laying steam lines into the soil and, and turning them on and thereby sterilizing the soil similar uh, to the way that is used to autoclave material. Um, another option for uh, uh, getting around or preparing the soil and, uh, as, a as a proper uh, receptacle for the rooting for the for the transplants is grafting, uh, combining uh, a rootstock and scion. And I will not belabor this point later because I because I think it will be addressed later. But grafting allows for a direct combination of, of traits uh, from two different varieties, and in some cases the results can be very dramatic, as is shown here in this particular image. Uh, the difference between a non-fumigated grafted in a non-fumigated, ungrafted crop where soil-borne disease is, is, uh, is evident. Plastic and plant residue mulches are also very, very important to us um, to exclude weeds and other, uh, other uh, pests and also to protect uh, low-hanging fruit, for example, from rain splash in the field, but which is less of an issue in the high tunnel, of course. But plastic and plant residue mulches are very, very important. They can help keep uh, an environment clean and uh, overall assist the crop manager in many different ways. Depicted in, in this particular slide is uh, the landscape cloth, which um, I have grown accustomed to using in, in high tunnels, partly because it allows us to lay the drip tape on the top uh, of, this, uh, of the landscape cloth rather than underneath the plastic, because it is porous. Um, plant residue mulches are also very important. And after a crop is established, uh, a, a uh, residue mulch consisting of some form of straw can be applied to help conserve soil moisture, reduce temperature, um, suppress weeds. And of course, many people use both plastic and plant residue mulches in combination to provide an overall uh, environment that is improved relative to, to uh, certainly disease management and, and horticultural crop production. The rewards from a colored plastic mulch have been inconsistent. Uh, for every report that suggests that they, are, uh, they offer an improvement, there is a report that suggests that there is no such improvement. So um, the jury is still out on, on colored mulches. 
plant population and spacing. I have less to say on that than perhaps on other topics and would just recommend to folks that the selection of the spacing and the population is contingent upon the variety that one is using, how, what, what is its maturity, what is its quote disease package, um, how large of a frame does the crop produce, what market are you selling for, where are you located, is the crop grafted. Um, one single recommendation on plant population and spacing is difficult but we do see on average of approximately four to five feet between rows of tomatoes and anywhere from 18 inches to uh, four feet between plants within the row. Pruning and trellising is a, is a topic that comes up very frequently and I think it has um, bearing on certainly disease management and this of course ref refers to the possibility of removing suckers or uh, shoots that arise from the axles of, of leaves and the main stem. We prune often to, uh, to improve air movement beneath the crop, reduce humidity within the high tunnel, uh, provide greater coverage for the real working leaves, if you will, of, of the crop. Um, people also tend to prune because they, they feel like in many varieties it provides them with a better pack out, essentially reducing the number of small fruit that are in the crop. And uh, if we choose to prune, well, what do we prune? Most folks remove the the suckers below the first cluster of fruit all the way to uh, the point of entry into the soil but not above that first cluster of fruit. And uh, this is a fairly newly pruned crop so you see uh, the, the rather long stems uh, single, pruned to a single stem with the, the leaves, of, the leaves on, on top. And this is a picture taken from Southern Ohio. Um, and uh, pictures here of uh, crops that um, I have grown in a high tunnel here in Worcester before and after pruning and what you see in the upper right hand uh, frame is all of the sucker material that was removed from that particular row laying there on the ground before cleanup so it'll give you a sense for how much plant material was removed from that row. Regardless, this is that same crop about 90 days later. One would hardly know that it was pruned uh, at, uh, at soon, soon after establishment. So. And the variety in this, in this case, is Cherokee Purple. And if you are familiar with that, you know that it is a very vigorous uh, variety. How to prune, pinch or snip um, that, that growing uh, shoot from its axle, but do it early in growth. Try to be as surgical as possible and as clean as possible. There are real and, uh, and possible costs to pruning. Uh, material and labor and sanitary uh, slash disease issues are, being, are, are one, because obviously if one plant is diseased, and we prune uh, or do not sterilize equipment, we can transmit that disease through the tunnel. We tend to use a stake and weave trellis, and in our case, we start early with that as soon as possible after planting. We reinforce the ends here with two uh, stakes often. We space them uh, about every two plants within the row, and we tend to use multiple layers within, within the crop for our trellis system. But sometimes things go wrong and we have windstorms that blow over our very heavy crop and break off the stakes. And in our case, we we're fortunate enough to simply pull that crop all the way back up to straight and retie it and restake it using uh, the buttress system depicted here. In the high tunnel, uh, we certainly have uh, a trellis system that goes up to uh, the crossbows, uh, shown with the twine here in these, in these particular panels. So uh, trellising and, uh, the crop is very, very important to uh, keeping, it, keeping it in order, if you will. Heating and cooling, uh, most of the time it's a combination of the doors and the sidewalls being open, uh, one or both, uh, at various times of the day. And depending on the conditions, um, whether we want a cross ventilation or ventilation down the tunnel, in my experience, a uh, vent in the end wall, especially on an 80-foot tunnel such as the one depicted here, is very, very helpful because it can allow one to keep the doors closed and the side walls down at, uh, and still vent excess heat. Shade cloth is, uh, is a favorite for some, and uh, I agree with it, uh, but it does cut down on the light. But during the main summer months, uh, there's usually enough light to certainly mature the crop, but, so shade cloth can reduce the temperature. Of course, you can invest in portable to semi-fully permanent uh, high tunnel heating systems or methods, uh, but do invest wisely and make sure that they are properly set up and vented. In our uh, recent work, we are exploring bottom heating as a, as a way to heat the high tunnel. Perhaps the rooting, heating the rooting medium as being perhaps more effective than heating the air above it. And of course, in this case, we're simply borrowing from uh, the systems that are widely used within sports uh, turf uh, management here showing the buried uh, hot water cables underneath the, the turf. And 
this is not tomato, but it's just a, a, an opportunity to show you the, that the heating cables do in fact work. On the right is the snow-covered uh, raised bed, and on the left uh, that, that snow is melted due to the heating cable beneath it. Irrigating and fertilizing, I see three issues within uh, this area, and I know that we're running close to my uh, uh, end of the time, but um, I want to emphasize that over-fertilization over is um, a growing issue within high tunnels, and we do have the option to grow hydroponically in high tunnels for, for certain. We need not use the soil. This is a strawberry example, but it could just as easily be tomato. And we have semi to fully hydroponic systems within high tunnels, uh, in some cases growing in popularity. Regardless of one system, I encourage you to track the nutrient flows using a whole farm planning approach. Know where the nutrients are coming from. Know, know uh, their fates. Uh, are they leaving the high tunnel in the form of fruit? Are they going into the soil? Uh, do your best to find a, a uh, develop a whole farm uh, nutrient budget. Because if you recognize that the nutrient water needs of the crop change with the, with the stage and season, and there is a sweet spot, so to speak, of nutrient application where um, too much is no uh, more is not any any better than uh, uh, than the previous amount, and not enough uh, is a, is a deficient. So soil sampling and analysis is a small fraction of your total costs, and uh, with a very high return on investment. And there are many uh, guides, bulletins, fact sheets written on the topic on how to take. Um, a, uh, a, a sample for tissue and sap testing. And those, those measures can be taken in the field or, or in a lab where one would send a dry tissue sample. Compaction, I believe, is a, is a growing issue in our high tunnel systems. And uh, you are well familiar with why soil quality can decline in vegetable systems. Um, it can be difficult to, to manage soil well within them. And we do have very, again, very prescribed traffic patterns. And we wonder if uh, those prescribed traffic patterns are doing a detriment to our crops. And there are many proven steps to minimize or alleviate compaction. Salt buildup is another issue within high tunnels. And uh, coming back to the slide set at a later date, you would see that the movement of water through the profile uh, can help alleviate that. And the uh, situation here, which is open field, this flooding rain, of course, will remove uh, uh, excess salt from the soil profile, whereas in the high tunnel, uh, that salt has an opportunity to build up. Um, I want to call your attention to one real quick uh, uh, situation here. This is furrow irrigation unintended when we had a flooding rain come into the high tunnel and essentially irrigate our crops from within the furrows. Perhaps that's something you've seen farm. But um, I'll skip over these particular images, but encourage you to come back to either the handout or the slide set uh, offered with this recording to better understand the influence of your irrigation pattern on the fertility program and the need for you to test the irrigation water, to treat your soil, to pay attention to salt buildup if needed, perhaps to even remove the cover from the high tunnel and allow nature with snow and rain to purge excess salt from the profile. And again, there are some very helpful practical tools available to you to assess and manage soil quality on your farm. And these are just two that I've listed here in the particular slide set. And to help uh, ameliorate some of those issues, I would encourage you to rotate and amend the soil, for example, with compost as best as we can. So in summary, uh, I hope to have provided you with an excellent system overview of tomato production and, and, a, and a good lead-in to the two speakers that we will hear from next, uh, who will address pests and mite and uh, disease management specifically. And uh, we covered this uh, set of topics uh, in this overview. And hopefully within an IPM context, you'll see that as uh, those, they are one uh, important pillar within an overall program. So with that, I wish you good luck. And uh, this is my contact information. And uh, we can, we can uh, link up uh, in any way that you would see fit at another date. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, chat pod. So what I'll do is I'll try to highlight them for you. When they come up, you can try to give them a response, OK? Sure, absolutely. I do see uh, some of the questions. Uh, which structural type would be best in 50 mile per hour wind gusts? Um, I tend to feel that the Gothic structures uh, might be more, most structurally sound in that, in that uh, situation and perhaps helpful to the crop, mainly because they are designed to be closed during those gusts and thereby protect the crop uh, in contrast to some of the quonset style structures that are designed to be open during the gusts.
There's a question from Tricia Wagner asking about, could you provide an example uh, of a crop as a fumigant? A number of the brassicaceous crops, uh, rapeseed, uh, sinapis, alba, um, uh, to a lesser extent, oilseed radish, um, are considered to be candidates, uh, uh, relatives of canola, um, that uh, pr produce naturally sulfur-containing compounds that when they break down into soil, have a soil sterilant-like activity, and perhaps uh, Sally can elaborate on that later, but they, members of the Brassicaceae family or Brassicaceous crop are, are right now um, regarded as perhaps the, the best candidates as a soil fumigant. There's also a question, Matt, about relative humidity in the high tunnel, uh, I believe, compared to uh, outdoor. Could you uh, answer that? Certainly. Um, relative humidity is a factor that I, I, I feel more and more, more and more people are paying more and more attention to. Uh, when, the, uh, when the high tunnel is open, in my experience, the, the relative humidity in, inside of it should be relatively similar to the, rel to the humidity outside of it. When it is closed, of course, it has a uh, great, greater probability of being much higher uh, relative humidity inside than outside. And it's the management of that relative humidity um, that I, I feel is uh, particularly important to growers. I, I think Sally may, may be touching on that later because leaf wetness and, um, can contribute to disease onset. As a general rule, I uh, recommend that folks keep the crop as dry as possible and to vent the high tunnel whenever possible without compromising its ability to provide greater uh, growing degree day units. Okay, uh, we have a response here about uh, a certain type of high tunnel that uh, survives some very high winds in Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any comments about snow load? Um, my comments about snow load are that uh, before, before purchasing a high tunnel, uh, certainly sit down uh, with your, uh, your, the weather records, the climate records for, for your area. Be very, very uh, aware of the typical snow loads that you, uh, snow amounts that accumulate or, 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 or receive in a, in a given uh, season. And work with either your local extension person, uh, myself, uh, Gene Giacomelli at the University of Arizona, somebody familiar with high tunnels and the design of structures to make sure that your high tunnels will withstand the snow load that is common to your area not only in the shape of the bow, but also in their spacing. And uh, both of those components together will dictate, uh, as I understand it, the, the, uh, the structural integrity of, of, uh, of the high tunnel. The farther the spacing between the bows, the less structurally sound it is. Uh, the higher the pitch, perhaps the, the more easily will shed the snow. Okay, Matt, well, thank you very much. That uh, concludes your time here in the program. Excellent presentation. We're going to now hear from Dr. Shubin Saha at Purdue University. He is the Extension Vegetable Specialist. His presentation will be on pest and mite management in high tunnels, including cultural controls, pesticide use, biocontrols, and organic methods. Shubin, you're going to have 35 minutes and five minutes of questions, so go ahead. Uh, webinar series. <clears throat> Again, uh, my name is Shabin Saha, and today I'm going to be talking to you about managing arthropod pests biologically in vegetable crops with a focus on solanaceous crops. Much of the information uh, that I'll be talking about today is from my four years of experience using biological control as a primary component to our IPM program at the University of Florida Protected Ag Research Project. So to get started, uh, on the first slide here, on your left you have some biological control agents and on your right you have a serious mite infestation on bell pepper as indicated by the severe webbing. These are just a few examples of what I will be discussing today with regards to managing key pests of protected structures and some of the available biological options. So what is biocontrol? Um, Biocontrol is a control of pests by disrupting their ecological status as through the use of organisms that are natural predators, parasites, or pathogens. Or, in simpler terms, big bugs have little bugs on their back to bite them, and little bugs have lesser bugs, and so ad infinitum.
Preceding definitions were for biological control in general for all plant problems such as weeds, diseases, and arthropods. Today's presentation, however, is focused on biocontrol for arthropods in protected structures. Biocontrol for arthropods is defined as living agents that directly mitigate arthropod pests. With biological control, there are a variety of relationships that can occur between the two interacting organisms. I will focus on two of those relationships, which are predator and parasitoid. By definition, a predator is an organism that lives by preying on other organisms. And by definition, a parasitoid is an animal, especially an insect, that is parasitic during the larval stage of its life cycle, but becomes free living when an adult. Next, I'd like to talk to you uh, about a few keys to success in terms of implementing biological control. Uh, you need to have a good understanding of the biological system. You need to understand concepts such as behavior, feeding, optimal temperature range, reproductive habits, and other things of that nature. Also, you need to be able to comfortably identify pests and the beneficial arthropods which you'll be using in the system. As you gain more experience, you will pick up on a number of different cues. In my own experience and in conversation with other colleagues, you typically will find that predatory mites typically are moving faster than the pest mites on the leaf surface. And we'll get more into this later in the presentation this evening. The second key to success is timing. For biological control, to be effective, it must be implemented in the early stages. It cannot function as when using pesticides or you may identify the pest and then go out and spray the crop. The biological components must be put in place at the beginning of the crop, typically to allow for sufficient population developmental time. In my own experiences, we would often inoculate our vegetable transplants with predatory mites just before planting. And the third key to success, which I want to hit, hit upon, is scouting. This is an extremely critical component, not only to integrated pest management, but to being successful at using biological control. At a minimum, you need to do scouting on weekly intervals within your growth structure. You also need to develop a scouting record uh, or data sheet. Within this data sheet, you need to have your growing area separated into different regions, and then you'll have columns which will indicate what beneficials or pests and their numbers that you're encountering uh, within your plot. Some of the other methods which you can use for scouting uh, is a paper method. Um, basically, you take a white sheet of paper and you shake the foliage over the white paper. This is a technique that often is successfully used with mites. Also, you can utilize things such as yellow or blue sticky cards. Uh, yellow, and, yellow sticky cards are typically geared towards white flies, where the blue sticky cards are typically utilized for thrips. Also, um, certainly not uh, the least, but, but one of the more important things to make all of this scouting process effective and work, you need a hand lens or a loop, both 10x and 20x magnification. So I'm going to talk about some of the common arthropod pests you, you might experience in a protected structure. The four primary pests that I'll be focusing on today are white flies, thrips, aphids, and spider mites. These comprise the major pests encountered when producing crops in protected structures such as high tunnels. One reason for this is that most of these arthropods have a very wide host range including solanaceous and cucurbit vegetable crops such as tomato, bell pepper, eggplant, cucumbers, and squash. And additionally, since these have been a consistent pests for a long time in protected structures, this is where much of the biological control research has an The first pest which I'll be talking about uh, is white flies. Um, White flies are in the insect order Homoptera. Uh, and one thing to note is that flies is sort of a misnomer, as they are not true flies since they have two pairs of wings. They have an extremely wide host range, including many vegetables, ornamentals, and weeds. 
Developmentally speaking, for white flies, eggs are typically laid on the lower leaf surface. Then there is a hatch, a first instar, second instar, third instar, pupa, and then the adult stage. And it's not uncommon for a female to lay upwards of 300 eggs. As with most insects, uh, the timing of development is based on temperature and can vary. Um, and can vary between two and four weeks. The approximate adult size of white flies is one sixteenth of an inch to one and a half millimeters. The damage is caused by feeding with piercing, sucking mouth parts. This in turn causes reduction in growth, defoliation, and ultimately reduced yields. One sign or presence of large numbers of white flies is the presence of honeydew. Honeydew is the sticky excrement from the white flies which supports growth of sooty mold. In the image on your left is the underside of an English cucumber leaf heavily infested with white flies. On your right you can see the sooty mold growing on the leaf tip. Typically from a biological management perspective, presence of sooty mold is an indication that white fly population is getting out of control. It would not be a good time to try and establish biological control at this stage if you have not already done so. Two most common white fly species you might encounter are greenhouse white fly, Trialoroides vaporarium, uh, and the silverleaf white fly, Bemisia argentifolia. Also be interesting to take note as far as uh, differentiating between the two. Greenhouse white fly has flat wings uh, and the silverleaf white fly holds their wings tent-like. The greenhouse white fly is probably what you might be most likely to encounter though in this area. In the image on the top left, we have a greenhouse white fly, and in the top right, we have a silverleaf white fly. Also note the immature stages on the left side of the silverleaf white fly image. It may be difficult to see from these photos. However, as I've already mentioned, one means of differentiating between the two species is the way the wings are held over the back. In particular, with greenhouse white flies, it's flat, and with silverleaf white flies, it's tent-like. In terms of white fly management, uh, individuals need to use an integrated approach, a number of different tactics, uh, cultural tactics, biological tactics. Um, one means uh, of excluding pest insects in protected structures is the use of insect screen. However, insect screen also does re reduce the ventilation capability, so you have to take that into consideration based on the size of the mesh of the insect screen. Lastly, pesticides should be considered a, a last resort, and especially when you're using biological control because there are very few that are compatible with biological control. In this slide, there are a few biological controls for white flies that I have used with success. In your upper left is a parasitoid wasp known as Encarcia formosa. In this image, you can see the different developmental stages including the adult emerging from the parasitized white fly nymph. In your upper right is a parasitoid wasp known as Eretmoceros aramicus. In this image you can see the adult. These are wasps, but they're not large like the common wasps which you may be uh, more familiar with. These are extremely small and are typically less than one millimeter in length. In the lower center portion of your slide you see an image of a Swirsky mite sachet. This is a means of dispersing this predatory mite into your crop. However, one point to note is that Swirsky mites have had some difficulty establishing populations in tomato crops due to the large amount of trichomes, but have been useful for white fly management in other solanaceous and cucurbit vegetable crops such as bell peppers and cucumbers. The next pest I'll be discussing is thrips. Thrips are in the insect order Thysanoptera. 
They are small, slender-winged insects, approximately one sixteenth of an inch or one and a half millimeters. They have an extremely wide host range as the white flies, uh, including both vegetables and ornamental crops. Development is hemimetabolous for this insect, meaning that the nymphs look similar to the adults without wings. In terms of time, it can range from 20 to 80 days, and again, this is temperature dependent. Typically, the eggs are laid in a cut slit in the leaf tissue, and pupation often occurs in the soil. Also, overwintering can occur in plant debris or soil, so this is where sanitation uh, may become important in your greenhouse or high tunnel, as it may be, uh, facility. Also, one thing to consider is that thrips can be virus vectors for such viruses, such as tomato spotted wilt virus. Uh, also, similar to some of the other pests, which I'll be talking about today, damage from thrips is caused via the piercing, sucking mouth parts, which ultimately leads to foliar and fruit damage, which in turn reduces yield. Western flower thrips, Franklinella occidentalis, and greenhouse thrips, Heliothrips hemorrhoidalis, are two common species. Again, in this instance, it's more likely that you will encounter flower thrips uh, in this area. In this slide, this is simply to show you an image of a western flower thrip. Again, this is just the beginning, uh, potentially, for you to start your understanding and learning how to properly identify uh, the pests and beneficials within your system if you choose to use biological control. This slide depicts greenhouse thrips and some of the damage encountered in a bell pepper crop. This species feeds more on leaf tissue and is not commonly found in the flowers as with western flower thrips. On the lower left you can see some of the defoliation on the lower portion of the plants. And on your right, in the upper hand corner, you can see damage on the underside of the leaf. And in the lower right hand corner, you can see, see severe damage on the fruit, which ultimately make the fruit unmarketable. <clears throat> With regards to thrips management, um, again, we want to take uh, an integrated approach using a variety of tactics. Insect screen is also a possibility to use with thrips. However, when choosing an appropriate mesh size to exclude thrips from entering your, your structure, uh, you greatly reduce uh, airflow throughout your structure. And again, since there are so few pesticides which are compatible with biological control, you should do anything in your capability to avoid the use of pesticide when implementing biological control. The next two slides will focus on biological options for thrips. For white flies, I provided examples that were both predators and parasitoids for thrips. Uh, the biological focus is going to be on predators. In the top right of your screen, you can see a predatory mite, Amblycelis cucumeris, attacking a thrips nymph. In the middle right portion of your screen, you can see an image of a minute pirate bug. Also included is a bottle of Thripor, which is a commercially available product through Copert Biological Systems, and it's available in three different species of minute pirate bugs. This slide just shows some more magnified views of the two predators depicted on the previous page. In this case, the minute pirate bug species is Aureus insidiosus, and in the upper right, it is labeled as Neocelius cucumeris. However, this is simply a synonym for Amblycelis cucumeris uh, if you're looking for it in the literature or uh, as a potential commercial product to use in your, in your high tunnel. Also, as with white flies, Swarsky mites have been used effectively for management of thrips. Aphids is the next uh, pest which I'll be talking about. They're in the insect order Homoptera. Aphids are generally wingless, small, soft-bodied insects. However, they can generate wings when population is too high 
or there is a reduction in food availability. Their color can vary greatly from green, yellow, orange, to dark brown, and again, like both thrips and white flies, the host range is very diverse, including a number of vegetable and ornamental crops. With regards to development, they reproduce parthenogenetically. Additionally, they can be viviparous, meaning that they have live birth. Uh, also, they can lay eggs, and from an egg to adult stage is approximately one week. Again, that's going to be temperature dependent somewhat. And the adult lifespan is approximately three weeks with the potential of upwards of 100 progeny. The average size for aphids is one and a half to two millimeters, and it can also vector viruses as both thrips and white flies can. And again, the damage is typically caused via piercing sucking mouth parts, thus malforming leaf tissue and reducing growth and yield. As with the previous pests, individuals can also use an integrated approach with cultural, uh, biological, uh, and other tactics. Insect screen is another possibility uh, to use. Again, you have to determine if it's economical for your given setting. Um, and lastly, pesticides, again, should be considered a last resort uh, due to the compatibility issues. Some of the common species of aphids include the green peach aphid, Mises persicae. They have shorter cornicles. And the cotton aphid, or also sometimes known as the melon aphid, aphis gossipi, have longer cornicles. If you're unfamiliar with the term, cornicles on aphids are small protrusions coming from their posterior end, and sometimes they're referred to as tailpipes in layman's terms. The image on your left is one of the green peach aphid, and the one on your right is the cotton aphid. Uh, take note in the image on your right of the cotton aphid that the cornicles, or tailpipes if you will, uh, are in black uh, on the posterior end. For aphids, there are both predator and parasitoid options for biological management. However, my experience was primarily with the parasitoid wasp, Aphidius colomani, in conjunction with banker plants which I will discuss on the following slide. Uh, the image on your left is the parasitoid wasp actually laying its egg in the aphid. Uh, this wasp is small in size, similar to the ones used for management of white flies. Uh, and on your right uh, is an image of ladybugs uh, feeding on aphids. Aphidius colomani can be seen in your upper right and is a generalist when it comes to parasitizing aphids. They can be released in your crop like with predatory mites. However, to establish, establish populations, the use of a banker plant is very helpful. Simply, a banker plant is one that provides an alternative food source for your beneficial insects until a pest aphid, such as the cotton aphid, is in your crop. In our system at the Protected Ag Project, we inoculated sorghum plants with a grain aphid, Rapelosiphum padi. This aphid will only feed on monocots and not on typical broadleaf vegetables such as tomatoes and peppers. So it's not to worry that you're intentionally bringing it into your protected structure. Once inoculated, the sorghum plant is placed in the protected structure at the same time as planting the crop. This is the best place to release the aphidius colomani so they can develop a population that can handle any undesirable aphid infestation. The sorghum banker plant, which we utilize, can be seen in the lower right. And there are other banker plant systems for mites and for white flies, but my experience uh, has primarily been uh, with the banker plant system utilizing aphids. Uh, the system for white flies uses a papaya plant and a, a white fly specific to papaya, uh, and it may not be something uh, that's utilizable this far north. Spider mites is the last pest that I'll be speaking about this evening. Uh, 
Mites are arthropods-like insects, but are not in the same class. Mites are arachnids, like spiders. Uh, spider mites aren't any different from the three previous, uh, previously discussed pests with regards to host range. It's extremely vast. Uh, regarding development, mites are parthenocarpic, meaning that they do not have to have fertilized eggs to reproduce. Males also do exist, but are much fewer at a 1 to 3 male to female ratio. The unfertilized females will give rise only to females. And again, development is time, is, excuse me, uh, developmental time is based on temperature ranging from 5 to 20 days. And again, females can lay several hundred eggs in a lifetime. And a general simple life cycle for spider mites goes from egg, larva, protonymph, deuteronymph to adult. Mites are very small. This is where your hand lens or loop will come in handy. Uh, they're approximately 0.4 millimeters. They're wingless, soft-bodied arthropods, and damage again is caused via piercing, sucking mouth parts, in this case, which is removing individual cellular contents, leading to stippling damage, which ultimately leads to a reduction in photosynthetic capability and ultimately yield. Additionally, as you saw in the first slide of today's presentation, uh, webbing can occur as populations uh, get to extremely high levels. The image on your left is a close-up of tetra Tetranicus urticae, also known as a two-spotted spider mite. On your right, you can see a heavily infested tomato plant as indicated by the significant amount of webbing. One point I'd like to make is if you are seeing webbing and you are now just trying to manage the problem, biologically is probably not a viable option. This is why scouting, early detection, and early establishment of biocontrol agents is very important. IPM in terms of, of spider mites doesn't differ a whole lot um, from the other pests. Again, we want to use an integrated approach, scouting, exclusion, sanitation, use of biologicals, uh, what this talk is focusing on. And again, there, there are very few chemicals which are going to be compatible with biological control. Uh, there, are, there is one example that does come to mind. Uh, we have used micronized sulfur uh, in the past for applications uh, to help with management of broad mites uh, with little effect on one of the predatory mites, Neocelius californicus. This slide depicts two predatory mite species which are effective at mitigating two-spotted spider mites. On the upper left, you have Neocelius californicus attacking a two-spotted spider mite. On the upper right is an image of Phytocelius persimilis, which is reddish in color, next to a darker spider mite. In the lower left is a small bottle used to disperse the predatory mites in the crop. The mites typically come shipped in, an, in bran in a small bottle similar to ones used for spices the bran is there to provide food for bran mites, which in turn provide food for the predatory mites during shipping, so that the predatory mites do not cannibalize one another, as they will eat each other. This is also a good time to take note with some of these images, some of the visual differences between the predator and the pest or prey. And don't forget, as I previously mentioned, as a general rule, predatory mites will be roaming and moving much faster over the leaf surface in search of food, as opposed to a slower moving plant feeding mite. The two images in this slide on the top show damage from severe spider mite infestation in bell pepper. On the left there is stippling damage and on the right there is webbing. The picture on the lower portion of the slide is showing the difference in eggs between the predator Neocelius californicus and the two spotted spider mites. Note the predator egg is larger and more oblong while the spider mite egg is darker, smaller, and spherical. Lastly, I'd like to finish up with just a few sources uh, of some of the biological control agents. Uh, I've had most of my experience working with biotactics and corporate biological systems. That's not to say that there aren't uh, a number of other companies that are producing similar or the same products under different trade names, um, but I've had good experiences with these three companies listed here, corporate biological, biotactics located in California, 
and BioBest. Lastly, I just, again, I just want to thank everybody for participating and helping. There, can you see that one? Yes, I see. Do you have to augment biocontrol in the high tunnel? Um, maybe that's something I should have hit, on, hit upon. I apologize. Um, most of what we, everything I did uh, for four years at University of Florida was we were augmenting the system. We were purchasing uh, various predators and parasitoids uh, and adding them into the system. Uh, and again, primarily at the very early stages, um, we wanted to uh, be able to also provide alternative food sources if the uh, pests that we were aiming to deal with are not present at the time. So that's why we utilized the banker plant system. Another question is, what about adding flowering plants in or outside the high tunnel to encourage parasitoids, i.e. dill, fennel, cosmos, and yarrow? Um, I'll be honest, I do not have any experience with adding flowering plants on the outside. Um, I'm not saying that it's not wouldn't be effective, but I think it's something that somebody would have to research and evaluate uh, the efficacy. Do spider mite eggs stick to foliage? Um, yes, spider mite eggs are fairly well attached to the foliage. I don't believe uh, you're going to be able to knock them off. Are there any low maintenance, low input companion crops to repel aphids or any of the pests mentioned in a high tunnel setting? I don't have personal experience with using companion crops or trap crops per se. Um, anybody else listening out there may be able to chime in, um, but I, I don't believe I've seen a lot of success of trap crop, trap crops in the literature. MSU E extension, will eggs of these four pests survive in the frozen soil? I would have to say likely they will not. And it's something that you will have to augment on a year-to-year -year basis or on a crop-to-crop -crop basis. Uh, Shuban, there's a question up top that I think you might have missed, and that is uh, from Carol Runkle. How quick, um, I think, do you start biocontrol for whitefly? Uh, biocontrol for whitefly, um, I would say probably within the first two weeks of transplanting, we will be taking uh, products such as Incarcia formosa or Eritmosaurus aramicus uh, or Eritmosaurus mundus. Um, Again, uh, it kind of looks like uh, a do not disturb sign, basically, that you would hang on your hotel room door, but on a much smaller scale. Uh, and, and glued to this card uh, are uh, parasitized white fly nymphs, uh, which the parasitoids will fly out of after they've been hung on uh, the plants throughout your structure. Any comments on drip irrigation applied pesticides and compatibility with biological control? Um, I don't have any personal experience using drip applied pesticides. Um, I would think, though, um, that it would be uh, more acceptable than foliar applied pesticides. However, I guess you would have to consider if there's any transfer um, from one organism to the other if, say, uh, the white fly, for instance, had gotten a small dose and had not died yet, and then it was parasitized or uh, something of that nature. Will parasitoids stay in high tunnels when the sides are open? Um, generally speaking, um, we, we always used insect screen uh, on our vent openings. Uh, where I worked previously, um, there is a, a possibility for them to fly out uh, and leave. However, um, 
if you're utilizing a bank or plant system and they have a readily available food source, I think they're going to hang out within the structure uh, unless they run out of food and then they have to go and search for more options. Can the augmented species become invasive? Um, uh, I don't think you ever want to say never, but in, in my best understanding of the biocontrol agents that I've used at this point, um, none of them have become invasive and they shouldn't really become a problem uh, in any other instance. Question from David Larry, are there any companion flowers such as marigolds, nasturtiums, etc., which may help deter such pests? Um, I've read some in the literature, but I have no personal experience. Uh, my gut feeling uh, would probably be to lean away from things such as marigolds and nasturtiums uh, until I maybe could see more evidence uh, that they work effectively. You've got about three minutes, Shaban, to answer a few more questions. Um, okay. You might want to take the one from Tricia, and uh, I just put my questions in there to uh, give us some talking points. So go ahead and, and take the questions you want. You've got about three minutes. Okay, thank you, Jim. Tricia Wagner's question is, how successful would you say biocontrols are compared to conventional or chemical control? I would say when used in the appropriate way, um, they can be as effective if it gives you any sort of idea or concept. Um, where I was working at previously, we were utilizing a half-acre enclosed gutter-connected structure. Um, within that structure, over the course of four years, I shared that space uh, with other individuals growing different crops. Um, and in that time, I made only two pesticide applications. Uh, so from my perspective, I would say biocontrol can be as successful as conventional or chemical control. Uh, and in some ways, if, if you can be successful at this, uh, if you're maybe not growing organically, you might be able to hit upon another niche market, uh, which is pesticide free. I know that there's a few uh, production facilities which use that angle uh, to help with the sale of their products. I believe Eurofresh is one of them. Eve Minson just has a comment. Please add IPM Labs and Lock New York to the supplier list. Uh, so for those of you out there uh, looking for other suppliers, it's IPM Labs and Lock County, or excuse me, Lock New York rather. Her presentation will be on disease management and high tunnels, including cultural controls, grafting, and organic methods. Sally? You've got 35 minutes and five minutes of questions and answers, so go ahead and begin your presentation when you're ready. It is going to be talk about diseases and, man and their management in tomatoes and in protected environments which for the purpose of this presentation primarily is going to mean high tunnels. Uh, those of you who attended Monday's webinar heard uh, Meg McGrath's overview of disease management in high tunnels. Uh, my role this evening tonight is to focus on tomatoes and I'll talk about several diseases that tend to be a problem in high tunnels in the Great Lakes region and how growers can go about addressing them including both uh, conventional and uh, organic options. As uh, you heard on Monday, and I'll continue to sort of harp on this, I guess, is that the diseases of high tunnel tomatoes are generally different, although there is overlap, with the diseases in the open field. And that is primarily because, for two reasons. One is because they're protected from rain in general, and also because the humidity is higher. And we got a very nice uh, discussion about that from uh, Matt Kleinhentz. So diseases that we generally call high humidity diseases can be a big problem. Now, diseases that generally require rain splash, like septoria or bacterial spot or bacterial speck that can be very common in the open field, are uncommon in, in uh, high tunnels, it, with the exception of sometimes around the, on the sides where, the, where uh, 
the uh, sides might be rolled up and a rainstorm comes in and blows them in from someplace uh, nearby. But generally speaking, uh, uh, the rain splash type of diseases aren't, aren't a much of a problem in the high tunnel, so I'm not really going to talk about those. So let's focus on the high humidity diseases. The first of them, uh, if you've been growing for any particular amount of time in a high tunnel, almost irregardless of the crop that you're using, you might have seen Botrytis gray mold. It's a huge problem in ornamental production, but also in the vegetables, it's a very big issue. This is a disease that's favored by cool and damp condition. Uh, and when you tend to see it is where you have very dense foliage, where there is poor air circulation. Now, I'm going to talk about all these diseases, about how you diagnose them, too, because it's very clear that if you don't have a proper diagnosis, it's very hard to know uh, how to, to manage these diseases. So let's talk a little bit about how you know it's gray mold. Again, this is a common one, and, and many growers have seen it before. But you have a couple different symptom types. Uh, um, OK, I'm going to try to figure out how to use this little uh, pointer here. Um, Let's, okay, here it goes. So, uh, botrytis tends, it's not a really strong pathogen, so it tends to get either succulent tissue, like young tissue on a plant, or plant tissue that's wounded, um, uh, or, um, for example, flower parts that are starting to senesce. So, you'll see those kind of tissues that will become infected. And um, I lost my, okay, try that again. There we go. Uh, so here is an example where you'll find that botrytis is sporulating, which is producing this sort of fuzzy, moldy growth on the, the top of the plant, it, or the fruit. It also can, can cause kind of a soft rot on fruit that looks uh, almost like a bacterial soft rot, but the difference being that, um, that if, you, if you were to cut that open and smell it, it doesn't have that rotten potato smell. The other thing that it can do is cause these little tiny circles on, on the fruits, either green or red fruits, which are we call ghost spots. And those ghost spots essentially are an infection that got started and then for some reason uh, stopped, but still can, uh, if it's bad enough, the fruit can become unsaleable because of all these little spots, although they tend not to cause a rot in the fruit. So again, because you have good air circulation generally in the field, you don't often see this disease in the field but it's very common in greenhouses and high tunnels. Here's another type of mold. Uh, this one is called uh, fulvia leaf mold. Fulvia is the name of the fungus that causes this disease. Again, it's another pathogen that's favored by cool temperatures and high relative humidity. Again, very rarely seen in the field in the Great Lakes region, certainly, uh, but common in greenhouses and high tunnels. It's quite distinctive on the foliage and you, if you once you've seen it you easily can distinguish it from other things sometimes on the fruit though as um, as you can see here on the bottom you'll see this kind of uh, brown coloration that has been um, mistaken for lape light on it, on the fruit and I'll show you that uh, pictures of lape light later and you'll see where the similarities lie but as far as the foliar symptoms it's very common, what you'll always see is a, a chlorotic, uh, kind of diffuse chlorotic spots on the top of the leaves. That means they're yellow, but they don't have a very uh, sharp margin. They're, they're uh, diffuse. And if you turn the leaf over, what you will always see, as long as the humidity is high, is the sporulation underneath the, the leaf. As you can see here, it can go across the veins. And the difference between this uh, this kind of sporulation that you're seeing, which is usually kind of an olive green color, is that it covers the entire lesion. Whereas if this were late blight, uh, you would see it uh, just around the edges of the lesion. So that's, besides the color being different, uh, this is very characteristic of this kind of sort of lawn of sporulation and usually in a circle and it's yellow on top. So there isn't too much uh, or very little other things that might cause something even similar to that. So it's very uh, easy to diagnose. Okay, another mold, this is the third one, and this one is called white mold, and this is caused by a fungus called sclerotinia. And this one can be extremely destructive because oftentimes 
where you'll find the attack is down at the base of the plant. And when that happens, it can girdle the stem entirely and that plant will wilt and die. And this again is becoming more and more common in greenhouses uh, or in, and high tunnels, particularly where there isn't any or isn't crop rotation and folks are growing tomatoes after tomatoes. So um, uh, let me just get that pointer back again. If when the relative humidity is high, what will happen is you'll see the actual white mold of growth. There's a white fuzzy growth on the outside of the of the plant. But if and sometimes you'll even see uh, right down here in this where I pointed the arrow is a, a little dark uh, uh, structure. Sometimes they get about the size of a rice grain. And that's called a sclerotium. And the sclerotia can be seen on the outside, but most certainly you can see them on the inside as well. If it's high humidity, you can see them on the outside. And that is the overwintering structure, and that's what you don't want to have uh, in your uh, system because that can live in the soil for many, many years. And what happens usually after a cold spell, uh, during the winter time, it survives very nicely up north. In fact, it's really not a, a disease you see in uh, southern uh, environments. And what you see here next to the penny on the right, that's one of the uh, the sclerotia. I'm trying to get my pointer back. There it is. So that's the sclerotium right there. And after this uh, cold shock, when the humidity is, is the environmental conditions are right, plenty of moisture and high relative humidity, these little these things are called apothecia, but they're like a cup. They're produced on that sclerotium. And when the relative humidity changes, they uh, shoot out spores. And those spores then can travel on the wind and infect plants. And that's where they usually the infection comes from in the spring. So if you have plants, that have got this, uh, this symptom and these signs, which are the sclerotia, they need to be removed right away from the greenhouse. And in fact, we always recommend that, and I'll talk about this a little later, but uh, we recommend that you dig out the soil about within about a foot diameter around, um, around that plant as well and discard all of that so that uh, you don't have the sclerotia surviving as well. Now, I mentioned tomato late blight already. That is uh, another cool, moist uh, condition pathogen where we commonly see that in, uh, in Ohio anyway. It's more often in, in the fall. Although uh, last year, in 2009, we had that in the summer as well. Um, and that was in the field. This is one disease that you'll see both in the greenhouse or our high tunnel and the open field. And uh, it's the protection, the rain protection you get from a um, a high tunnel is not sufficient to protect against late blight. So it can easily get into the late, if it's blown, the spores are blown in, uh, you easily can get an infestation of uh, late blight. And this is a very, very serious disease because if you haven't got fungicide protection on the plants, can uh, kill an entire greenhouse within a few days after, uh, after infection. So it's very important that, uh, that late blight be controlled. Again, it's a sporadic disease. Some years we don't see it at all. And where we have seen it, except with the exception of last year, which was a little bit unusual in 2009, we tend to see it in the fall when um, uh, there is kind of because of the, the, the big difference in temperature between the, the daytime when it's sunny and it gets cool at night, there can be a lot of condensation. And that is very conducive with that kind of moisture conditions for late blight. Now, again, the symptoms of late blight are, are pretty characteristic, but we've noticed that people they often have a difficulty distinguishing a late blight from other things. But uh, on the fruits, you often see this very bronze coloration that was a little bit similar to what we showed you uh, for a leaf mold. You, if it's very humid, you can see the white mold. You also will see these dark, and it, the lesion should always be a very dark brown color on the stems and, uh, and the petioles, as you see here. And if the relative humidity is high, especially in the morning, you go in there and look at the back of the leaves, you'll see necrosis in the middle and then uh, this ring of this white sporulation around. And if you see that, that's a very strong indication that you've got uh, late blight. All right, so powder and mildew. Now this is a kind of a, a disease that's out on its own in terms of the environmental conditions that are required. It's, it's one of the very few, in fact, the only one I really know of in terms of a fungus that, that doesn't like cool or warm rainy conditions. It likes it to be dry. And where you tend to have problems with powdery mildew is, uh, is under very dry conditions. So again, this disease 
is very rare in the field, at least for us. Sometimes you can get about breaks of powdery mildew in the field, uh, but that's not too often. But you can get it uh, in the high tunnels, and, and a lot of times our growers will be concerned about some outbreaks of powdery mildew in the greenhouse or a high tunnel. And when it starts off, you can see the powdery mycelium on the top of the leaf, um, as you see right here. And then uh, as it progresses, this was actually taken in a greenhouse, you'll get these necrotic and chlorotic spots on, on the leaves. And they don't generally uh, kill a plant outright, but they certainly reduce the photosynthetic capacity, and they, the plants will certainly um, be considerably reduced in productivity if powdery mildew is not. Uh, not controlled. Okay, so now uh, we've talked about the the fungal diseases, and I want to now to move on to bacterial diseases. And the primary one that I want to talk about is bacterial canker of tomato. And bacterial canker is a field problem and a um, and a high tunnel or greenhouse problem. And in fact, it's one of the most important diseases of uh, greenhouse tomatoes uh, in the uh, large production greenhouses. And this is a systemic disease. It gets into the vascular system, the xylem elements, where the water uh, conducting vesicle, vessels. And uh, it moves there, it clogs them up, and, uh, and disrupts the, the water flow, but also causes a lot of damage so that the plants can be killed outright. If they're not, they generally are stunted and, uh, uh, and very unproductive. Uh, they also produce fruit spots, and they can be pretty nasty uh, fruit spots, as you'll see on this one out in the field. In the greenhouse, they tend to pro not produce the spots, but they produce kind of a netted, uh, netted uh, symptom. And uh, from a infected plants, the fruits tend to be very small. Uh, you also can see kind of a silvery speckling or spotting, as well as cankers on the stems and, uh, and petioles and branches of the tomato plant. If you have bacterial canker, it's not always easy just by uh, looking at the at the, the vascular discoloration because it's just kind of a a light brown discoloration, and other things uh, can do that as well. Now there are two things important about this. One is it is seed-borne disease, and so some of the biggest outbreaks that have occurred have been in greenhouses have been because it came in in, in a seed. Uh, other ones, uh, other means of uh, of introducing it into a greenhouse or in grafted plants or in non-grafted transplants if it happens uh, to spread around in the, in the greenhouse. It's also very easily mechanically transmitted. So pruning operations, you have to keep that in mind, uh, that, that there has to be excellent sanitation during pruning and any other crop work to make sure that this disease is not spread. And that's one of the reasons why this disease is so important in production greenhouses is because uh, uh, just the, the fear of that disease being there has resulted in a lot of extra uh, sanitation steps that didn't, uh, weren't done in the past. Uh, this disease, or uh, the pathogen, is also persistent in the soil and on the seed. So we have had the infested seed lots in our laboratory that still are infested five to seven years after uh, we initially collected them. As I mentioned, the plant transfer production, whether it's grafted plants or not, uh, can be very important in epidemiology and spread of this disease. Um, the other problem is that uh, uh, the stunting, it's a vascular pathogen, so the, re it's re the reduced fruit size and the stunting are most often seen under environmental stress. So if the plants are not particularly stressed, sometimes they can kind of manage along fairly well, but once there's stress, then you really start seeing it. So it does get worse uh, under conditions where there's plenty of moisture, but, uh, but where you really see the disease is when the plants are stressed. The other, uh, another major issue, though, is that the high levels of disease resistance are not available. There's a few tomato varieties that have a little bit of resistance, but, but basically uh, the plants don't have this, uh, this ability to resist the disease. Now another one that Meg mentioned is tomato pith necrosis, and this is a, a disease that, again, it's fairly common but in high tunnels, but the incidence is not usually very high. There are, one, there are a couple of different bacteria that can cause pith necrosis. A few of them are more common than others. Um, they are soil-borne bacteria that are generally out in the soil. Um, they're common soil inhabitants, so uh, there isn't really a seed connection with this particular disease. 
The symptoms that it causes, you can see here, are pretty diagnostic um, If once you look inside the stem. If you're just looking at the outside, it's kind of nondescript darkening of the tissue, and several things can cause that. But once you open it up, what you're going to see are two things. One is this discoloration of the, of the pith. That's why it's called pith necrosis. But also you'll see this sort of a laddering effect in both the necrotic area and then above the necrotic area. So you'll see white pith there that's dried out and got, looks like a ladder. So that's a very diagnostic of uh, pith necrosis. Where you see pith necrosis is where often there's excess nitrogen and uh, high relative humidity and often overwatering. So if there's all those things are going on, uh, that's the imp not a good environment for tomatoes. And, uh, and if there's a wound, a usually wound associated, this, uh, these bacteria can get in there from the soil and, uh, and kill the plants. And the plants certainly can be killed very easily by this uh, once it gets rolling. Okay. Now I want to talk about a couple of viruses. Uh, one that we haven't seen yet in high tunnels, at least not to my knowledge. So other people may have seen it in the Great Lakes region. It's very, very common in greenhouses. But in the high tunnels so far now, it's Papino mosaic virus. This is a seed transmitted disease. It's also very easily mechanically transmitted. And it basically reduces the productivity of the plants. You get a lot of chlorosis and modeling. And uh, again, it's something we need to keep an eye out for. Uh, and we don't definitely want to, uh, hopefully, don't see, start seeing that in the high tunnels. Other common disease uh, virus is tobacco mo or tomato mosaic virus. This is, again, seed and mechanically transmitted, very common. And uh, out in the, it can even be out in the field. And where we've tended to see this is, is uh, where the uh, sort of uh, beginning growers have gotten into uh, producing um, tomatoes and uh, they haven't tried worked very well with all the sanitation practices during trans during uh, transplant production, so you can have a problem in that in that instance because this disease is or the virus is very easily transmitted. So, example for and it's very very stable. So, a tobacco mosaic virus can survive in cigarettes and other tobacco products. And so smokers uh, or tobacco users in general can spread this around if they're not careful with, uh, with washing their hands and possibly using some other things I'll talk about in a moment. I think this is the last one I want to talk about is tomato spotted wilt virus. And this is a, a virus that's transmitted by thrips. And we uh, can see this in tomato seedling production in our region, the Great Lakes region, if this uh, transplants are being produced alongside ornamentals, which often are carrying that virus. And so if you have a thrips problem and you have the virus source, then they can get into the, the trans the seedlings. And if that happens, it uh, can totally destroy the tomato crop, in fact, because it spreads pretty widely. In, our, in some areas of the world, you often see it in the field. Uh, but if, in our case, generally, if it doesn't come in on the transplants, we don't see it that much, at least not, uh, not in my experience. OK, so how are we going to manage these tomato diseases? And uh, essentially, it's the same way we would manage in the high tunnels we manage in the field uh, in terms of the basic principles. So it's always first scouting and diagnosing the problem correctly, uh, reduce or stop the transmission of the pathogen, Manage the environment, uh, use resistant varieties whenever we can, and consider the use of effective fungicides or biologicals. And again, I'll, I'll reiterate what we've heard all, uh, on Monday and today is that uh, in high tunnels, the use of a pesticide should be a last, uh, last uh, effort, a last ditch effort, because uh, uh, they can interfere with other things going on. There are worker protection issues because of particularly if you're growing indeterminate types and you have to reach up above. So I, I think that uh, fungicide use should be the last resort, uh, only if uh, that's the way you have to use it to protect the crop. OK. So first, let's talk about scouting and diagnosis. So uh, essentially, it, <laughs> the you know the, the 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 area of your high tunnel is not particularly large, and so there is really not any reason not to go in there and check out those plants on a regular basis, and look for wilting or spots or other kinds of symptoms. Now there are all kinds of things on the internet. There are the plant pathology or APS compendia. There's a compend very nice compendium of tomato diseases. There are lots of books available, and in fact even this. Uh, presentation handout that you have has got some nice pictures of different diseases. So you can use those to start with the symptoms. 
But even the most experienced uh, folks cannot always determine the, diagno or the diagnosis of a disease based on the symptoms. So you may have to have uh, laboratory testing done. And uh, that can be done by sending or bringing the samples to either a commercial or a university diagnostic lab. So all the land-grant institutions in the states in the, in the Great Lakes region have a diagnostic plant diagnostic laboratories. And that will accept and, and do these kind of diagnostic evaluations and tests, uh, usually for a, sm uh, a small fee. Uh, some of them do not charge a fee, but most, most do. And uh, you can get the very good results back from those labs. And if you don't know where the lab is in the, your state, you can usually just find it by Googling the name of your state and plant disease diagnostic clinic. And you'll be able to find it. The other option, and also clinics will use these, are commercial kits such as the ones you see on the right. And these are some virus tests. And the blue ones are uh, Ralstonia, which uh, is a bacterial disease we don't really have here. These were taken uh, outside of this region. And these are, are very rapid tests. They only take a few minutes to run. And they tend to be quite accurate. I will make a point, though, that there is a test. This company that makes them is called Agdia. And there are a couple, it's in Indiana. And there are a couple other uh, uh, companies as well that make similar tests. Uh, they're very good tests, but I, I just always use the caveat that the current uh, test for a bacterial canker is a good screening test, but there can be false positives. So if you want to use that test and you get a positive, before you make any drastic decisions, you need to send that, those plant samples in and, and get a confirmation from a laboratory. Okay, so once you know what you have, uh, you might have to make some decisions. Some of the things I'm going to talk about now are not to be done after you have a, have a pathogen problem, but to prevent it in the first place. And so first thing is to consider is the seed. And seed transmission is important for viruses, certain viruses, certain bacteria, even certain fungi. Most um, seed producers, particularly the large one, uh, test for the known important pathogens like bacterial canker. Uh, for some of the viruses, et cetera, but they have to test only on a, a, a seed lot sample. They can't test the entire seed lot. So the pathogens can escape detection just because of sampling error or there are other reasons as well. But it's not 100% guaranteed that because it's been tested that it's free of a particular pathogen. Now, how you can get around that, that uncertainty or risk is that you can sanitize seeds to remove pathogens in there various treatments that are available and have been available for a long time. We recommend dilute Clorox treatment or hot water treatment. Uh, the, the dilute Clorox treatment is much easier to do than, than the uh, hot water treatment, which requires some equipment. Uh, but the hot, the Clorox treatment that's questionable and you have to, if you're an organic grower, it's questionable whether you can use that or not. You have to check with your, your uh, certifier. All of the details about how to do these Treatments are available on the fact sheet that is shown right here uh, that starts with Ohio line. Those, uh, and I recommend if you're thinking about treating uh, your seeds that you look into that. If you're saving your own seeds like an uh, open pollinated uh, heirloom variety, you should really consider uh, doing a, a seed treatment because you really don't have the option of testing for pathogens. There are concerns about treatment reducing vigor, and if it's not a high quality seed lot, you might have a problem there. Also, if the seeds are primed or pelleted, you can't do these treatments, particularly if they're primed, because it really could interfere with germination. And if it's pelleted, you just lose your pelleting, and that's uh, you know, money down the drain. Pathogens can also move in water. And uh, this can be true of bacterial cells, uh, which actually can have flagellae and can move. Uh, so there are some motile fungal or oomycete spores, like Phytophthora has motal spores. And some of these pathogens are simply just moved uh, passively through water. Uh, and also can, uh, water can splash and this, these pathogens up onto plants. So, or they can move them and it protects a uh, a hydroponic system can just move them very passively from plant to plant. So uh, water transmission is uh, potentially a, an issue. So how do you, to avoid uh, transmission of pathogens in water is, first of all, is avoiding overhead irrigation. Uh, and uh, most of the time, trickle irrigation is used during the, the production phase. 
But when the transplants are being produced, often they're overhead irrigated. And in that case, often you can't do anything about that. You have to, that's the best way to irrigate them. But it should be the transplant producer should be very careful not to overwater, to try to keep those plants as dry as possible, to, to minimize the spreading of, uh, of uh, pathogens and uh, allow the plants to dry so that they're not infection periods. Also, uh, the surface water sources should be avoided. And uh, basically, if you're using pond water or river water to in your high tunnel, you're just asking for trouble. And uh, because oh, my seed diseases that cause root rot and other soil-borne pathogens are often in the water, and you just shouldn't use surface water um, at all. But particularly not in a high tunnel where you have a very high-value crop. If you're uh, in a greenhouse situation, you're using recirculated water, which must be sanitized. And there are lots of ways of doing that. Okay, another way pathogens move around is through soil and, and uh, plant debris. And one thing I haven't talked about is crop rotation because a lot of folks have high tunnels that cannot be moved. If you have a high tunnel that can be moved, and we heard about this on Monday, that's really the best option because you can uh, uh, just move the tunnel to a, a soil that's been prepared and hasn't had tomatoes in it for a while. That's really the best. Uh, but if you can't, you have some ways to try to help uh, reduce the inoculum or the pathogen uh, propagules in the soil. So these things have specialized structures, like you see on the top that those are oospores, which are an overwintering structure for the phytophthoras, and pythiums, which cause root rots. Um, at the bottom one, we just talked about the sclerotinia. And so those kind of things can survive a long time in the soil. So one way to um, uh, deal with this is to, let's go to the next slide, uh, is sanitation, okay? So sanitation is so, so critical in a high tunnel. Uh, if you are in a production greenhouse, uh, if you've ever visited one of these large ones that you see in the picture there, uh, I always tell people it's almost like a hospital that's so clean in there. Um, and we can't expect that same level when you have soil in a, in a high tunnel. But the structure should be cleaned very thoroughly. Uh, workers who come in there should have a clean clothing every day. Uh, equipment needs to be clean and sanitized. There should be foot baths before you go in and where you exit uh, with active disinfectant and recognize that disinfectants can be are often readily uh, deactivated by organic material like soil. If you have tobacco users, uh, they need whether it's whatever type of tobacco that's being used, they need to wash their hands carefully. Uh, with soap and water and then rinse them in 1 to 3 percent trisodium phosphate to prevent the virus transmission. Some people use uh, 1 percent dry milk for that purpose as well, which seems to work quite well. The other thing, if you remember what Matt Kleinhans mentioned about all those plants from the pruning, all that debris, uh, if you're uh, pruning plants, that plant debris must be taken out of the high tunnel. And also I do recommend that not, not only visitors but just other folks and don't have uh, uh, pets and visitors in the high tunnel. Uh, try to minimize that as much as possible just because that's just a way of bringing in more soil and debris. I'll talk briefly about common disinfectants and um, there's a list of them here. Uh, various alcohols, halogens like chlorine, bleach, peroxides, and uh, quaternary ammonium compounds. Now, alcohols are very good for virus and bacteria, even fungi, they work quite well. Uh, bleach is good. There are problems, again, as I mentioned, potentially with using bleach, even a dilute bleach solution uh, in organic systems, but, and also bleach is corrosive to metal. Uh, we've looked at Vircon uh, at the 1-2% um, level. We found it very excellent for bacterial um, disease. I see I've got two minutes to go. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and uh, the, the, of the quaternary ammoniums we've worked with, uh, Clean Grow is also very effective. But some of these others are also effective as disinfectants. Again, for organic production, the hydrogen peroxide sanitizers are fine. Uh, uh, again, needs to be looked at individually. But as far as being allowed to use them, they, they are on the armory list and they can be used. Um, the chlorine products, again, there are some on the OMRI list, but you just have to look at the restrictions and certainly check with your certifier, and you can look at this website to find more information. Okay. 
Air currents can also transmit the, the diseases. They, the spores just basically blow into and within the greenhouses. And also insect vectors can be brought in on air currents as well. So essentially, you can't stop them from blowing in. Your screening will not take care of them. So you have to destroy the crop sources. So destroy the crop uh, debris inside. Eliminate any coal piles. Coal piles should never be anywhere near a high tunnel or a greenhouse. And then control the weeds in and near the greenhouse. Um, they also, if you have a lot of weeds, that will increase the relative humidity or reduce the air circulation. So you, you definitely uh, want to deal with, uh, with uh, those weeds in that way. I won't talk about insect transmission, as we heard uh, quite a lot about uh, that already. And, um, and essentially, the IPM approach is, approach is critical. There are a number of the thrips and white flies that can carry uh, viruses. Thrips mainly are the issue uh, in our region. Okay, so let's just talk quickly about environmental conditions. So again, most of them want high relative humidity and or free moisture. So for tomato, the temperature optimum is between 75 and 80, 85 degrees during the day and a lower temperature at night. Relative humidity should be kept as low as possible and you have to maintain that air movement either by rolling up the sides. In some cases, people will put in fans, vents, and even I've seen polyethylene tubing going through the greenhouse to try to get that air movement. And again, we heard a lot about pruning to open up the crop canopy and that's very critical. Okay, host resistance. That's the cornerstone of organic production for in terms of disease management. Find those varieties that are have the best and the most uh, resistance available. You can find that on the seed providers list. They'll tell you what they're resistant to. The only point I want to make is that tolerance. They're always talking about tolerance. That tolerance doesn't mean the true uh, definition of tolerance. It means partial resistance. So when you see tolerance, it almost always mean partial resistance. It means it's just not fully resistant. Uh, no varieties of resistance to all diseases, and sometimes the host resistance can be overcome by pathogens. So this is just a list, and you can look this over in your your uh, your leisure. But there, it's just an example of these are all indeterminate tomato varieties. This is a rootstock, uh, and it shows some of the the resistances that are available. And these are generally the kind of varieties that are used in the greenhouses, but some folks are using those in in high tunnels as well. Uh, there's a very good source of information on these uh, disease-resistant varieties. One is an ATRA um, publication. The other one is a website that's run by Cornell and updated regularly. There are uh, variety lists for all different kinds of crops, and, and they tell you what resistance is available in those different varieties, and you'll get your indeterminate and determinate tomato types there. Uh, grafting is another option that we've heard about and essentially very common in greenhouse production. It imparts disease resistance and improves vigor. But again, we have to be really careful in grafting that strict sanitation is undertaken so you don't spread diseases while grafting is being done. And if you're interested in grafting, uh, there are websites out there. Matt Kleinhens has a, uh, and David Francis at Ohio State have a website that uh, talks about tomato grafting for high tunnels. The last thing I'm wrapping it up is to talk briefly about fungicides. And the point I want to make about fungicides, this is a list that shows uh, what is allowed in Ohio, the state of Ohio. And you have to check with your uh, state department of agriculture to see what the rules are for the use of fungicides or other pesticides in uh, high tunnels. In the state of Ohio, a high tunnel is considered the same as a greenhouse. And also, if, the, uh, if there's no restriction on a label, for use in the greenhouse, the product can be used in a high tunnel. So these are some that have no restrictions for use in the greenhouse. And uh, again, they're just kind of the general types of, uh, of same things that are used out in the field. Again, I don't recommend them unless uh, they're spot, treatment, spot treatments or uh, if um, you really seriously have got a, a disease threatening you have to take care of. There are biocontrol alternatives. And again, with biocontrol of plant pathogens, the problem that we have is consistency. And what might work on one farm may not work on another. And so I always recommend look at a list of things, whether your problem generally is or for root infecting pathogens is uh, the uh, Sporodex is a powdery mildew product, is to look at these, uh, experiment them with them on your own, uh, and see how they work in your own situation. 
Thanks for your attention. If you'd like to have some more information, you can look at my website, which is in red here. And also we have, uh, in the eOrganic system, we've got uh, an article that uh, discusses some of these things for organic management in high tunnels. So uh, hopefully there's time for a question or two. Okay, Sally, thank you. We had uh, a few minutes there. We haven't tried it, but I, I wouldn't count on vinegar uh, as, as, as a use as, as a disinfectant. And even, but there are quite a lot of things that are allowed to be used in organic systems for uh, surfaces that can you know, um, be tried. So you're really not, as far as just disinfecting your surfaces, uh, there's quite a, a lot of options in the organic system. Of course, in a conventional system, there are even more. The next question, uh, what's the Clorox to water ratio for seed treatment? That's one part Clorox, four parts water, and that's a five minute soak, followed by about five minutes um, rinsing. Again, look at that, that fact sheet. You can download it for free online, and it gives you the details about how to do that. Any uh, effective biofungicide uh, to control powdery mildew? I mentioned that uh, the one, I think it's called Sporadex. And again, we don't have a lot of experience with that. Now, another, if you, if you think of a biorational one, people have done all kinds of experience with, or experiments with different types of uh, biorational fungicides, like Armacarb is one, which is a, uh, uh, like a baking soda type of thing, but potassium bicarbonate. Um, a little bit different from that, but it's, it's potassium bicarbonate, and that is pretty good against, you have to apply it fairly often, but that's pretty good. Some people have even, again, tried dilute milk, and again, you have to apply that pretty often, and it's probably not cost effective because milk's quite expensive by the gallon. So uh, there are other options uh, for pottery mildew control. Another one is uh, the hydrogen peroxide products. Again, you have to be careful not to burn the plants, but some of our growers are convinced that they can control uh, pottery mildew with, um, with hydrogen peroxide products. Okay, uh, we observed, ex or sorry, we experienced consistently lower relative humidity in tunnel than outdoor field and strawberry uh, cultivation. Uh, my get, okay, any idea? Well, Matt might be, if Matt Kleinhans is still on the line, he may be better um, able to answer that question. My guess would be uh, that you have low plants and you can get a lot of air movement around them. But why that would be lower than outside, I'm, I'm not certain. Uh, Matt, if you want to, I don't, I don't see Matt picking up the, the thing. So uh, if he wants to come in later, for, there you are, Matt, okay. Um, yeah, just to take a comment on that briefly, I was surprised uh, by that question or that, that, that experience. Um, I'd like to learn more about it. Perhaps we can talk offline, but um, it's again, it's been my consistent experience that a, a high tunnel managed in a typical way will often have higher relative humidities than the outdoor environment with one potential exception, and that in, in the warmest part of the day, given the temperatures are so much, can be so much higher in the tunnel, it would then correspondingly drop the relative humidity uh, at that point. Okay, okay. Thanks. that was a great uh, chime in there, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Sally, and thank you, Shaban, for your time this evening. Those are all great presentations. Uh, at this time, we are going to conclude our second webinar. Our next webinar will be next Wednesday, November 8th, or excuse me, next Monday, November 8th at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. The topic will be pest management in winter crops. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up a closing slide here.